In your bulletin, there's a yellow insert, looks like this. I want to make sure that everybody has a copy of that insert, choir two. If you don't, uh, if you're sitting next to somebody who has one, that's enough. But uh, as we get started here, I'll give you the chance to run back and, and grab a, uh, a bulletin if you didn't pick one up on the way in, because I, there's a picture on one side of that, and I want, I'm going to be talking about that picture in about uh, 10 minutes or so, and I want to make sure that we all are able to look at that. But as we begin our time of uh, gathering around the Word today, I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this great music we've just heard and reminder of, of simple gifts and how important they are, that everything is a gift from you. But also, God, we thank you for the gift of your word today and the opportunity that we have to gather around it. May the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and prayers be pleasing to you, our King of kings, rock and redeemer. Amen. How many of you were here last Sunday, November 18th? That was a really awesome Sunday. Am I right? I mean, last Sunday at 10.30, 10.30 service. If you, if you, if you weren't here, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill you in here. Last Sunday at 10.30, right here, we had 11 trombone players a trombone choir from Millican University providing us worship music led by a most amazing, world-renowned trombonist by the name of Peter Steiner. Wow. Incredible. With all due respect to all the trombones I've ever heard in my life, this was amazing. And then at 9 o'clock, right before that, Many of you probably don't know this. At 9 o'clock service last week, we had our second straight week of 65 people in worship. I mean, just a full house down there, growing, a lot of energy in that service. While all those services were going on, we were forced to smell the wonderful cooking of Thanksgiving dinner. If you were there at the Thanksgiving meal, I'll say, go on record as saying, Last, Thanksgiving, last week's Thanksgiving meal, one of the, the top two or three church meals I've ever had. And I've been to a lot, church meals, as have you. And then after my turkey-induced nap that I got uh, with whatever my upright office chair allowed me to get after that, that carbo-loading session downstairs, we gathered here in the sanctuary at 2 o'clock, for Peter Steiner, tr trombone concert, three letters, wow, right? Just absolutely incredible, just amazing. And of course, to top it all off, we were all in our own way looking forward to our own Thanksgiving week. Half week of school, lots to celebrate, maybe traveling. I mean, last week was really special, wonderful day. And next week, December 2nd, even better. can almost guarantee it. It's called Hanging of the Greens. We officially start to get ready for Christmas. Donna Dash went on record a couple weeks ago when she stood up here and gave a testimony about what she loves about the church, calling it one of her top five or six services of the year. Not many people are going to refute that. It's going to be special, special music, Special groups providing music, decorations galore, the 12-foot Christmas tree out in the Friendship Center. It's, I can already tell you, Don and I and Dee Dee, the choir, Tina, we've already put hours into making next week special. And then there's today, November 25th, the sandwiched in the middle at the end of a long week. It's easy for today to get overlooked and overshadowed by the anticipation of last week, by the excitement we're looking forward to next week. Poor little November 25th, stuck right here in the middle. 
But I would submit to you today that today is a much more important service than last week or next week. And not just because Luke, wherever he is, did a great job providing special music today. Today is a big day. And so I want to thank you for being here today. It's easy to come on the big days when everybody knows something special is going to happen. But you're here on this day, from the surface of it, a plain day, a day that admittedly Don and Dee Dee and I and probably the choir, I'm not going to speak for you, Tina, we don't get as nervous about. Right? But this day is important for this reason. For this reason. Next week starts the season of Advent. Say that word with me. Advent means arrival. It's a Latin term. Advent means arrival. And it encompasses four Sundays prior to Christmas every year. So next Sunday is December 2nd, then the 9th, the 16th, and the 23rd. Those are the four Sundays before Christmas Day. That's called the Advent season. Advent is a, is a time that the church sets aside to get ready for the arrival of Christ at Christmas. It's our way, it's the church's way of keeping Christ in Christmas. Right? Advent is our reminder that though we celebrate Christmas with bells and whistles and lights and uh, decorations and extra special music and in our homes special baked goods and shopping and presents and Cyber Monday and all of that stuff, none of that really matters. Oh, sure, it matters to us emotionally, but it does not matter spiritually and it does not matter salvifically, meaning it has nothing to do with salvation. Because Advent and Christmas are really about this truth. God choosing Christ to come into the world and Christ choosing all of us to share himself with. And today, November 25th, on the surface of it, a plain day, is the perfect time, the perfect time to hear this truth before the madness begins. And so it won't get lost in all of the special fancy things we do that even though we love them so much can also be distractions. So I'm going to say two things as we unroll this sermon today. Number one, I am thankful that you are here today. And I challenge you not to be inspired by this message and number two, I am not taking the day off, right? I am bringing my A game today because that's how important this day is. But, but our scripture that gives us the basis for our message today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. And so I invite you to listen if you'd like to or read along if you want but here's what's happening. It's the day of Jesus' death. In just hours, he's going to be crucified. And before that happens, he's standing before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And Pilate, right after this conversation, is going to hand Jesus over to die. But before that happens, Pilate is interrogating Jesus about whether or not he is a king. And this is how the conversation unfolds. Then Pilate again entered the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? J Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. 
If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am. But for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? The word of God for the people of God. So life is all about choices. Life is all about choices. We could not even count all of the choices we're faced with. Should I go here? Should I go there? Should I talk to this person or that person? Should I say this or keep my mouth quiet? Right? What should I do? Choices everywhere. And when it comes to faith, the question is, in whom will we place our faith and our trust? Will we place it in Pilate or in Jesus? Whom, to whom will we give our attention? Whom will we choose to serve, Pilate or Jesus? Both Pilate and Jesus are leaders, but of completely different realms and kingdoms. And the choice is ours. In whom will we place our trust and faith, in Pilate or in Jesus? If we choose Pilate, then we should know a few things about his world. First, Pilate's world is an earthly world. It is the lower world. It's everything down here that we can see and touch and feel and smell and taste. It's this world. In Pilate's earthly world, strength is measured by how quickly and decisively you can get your point across and your objectives accomplished regardless of what's sacrificed around you in the process. In Pilate's world, power is measured by how much and effectively you can bend others to do your will. Pilate's world is a world of quick fixes and instant gratification. Give it to me, give it to me now, regardless of whether or not that has lasting impact. And, and therefore, Pilate's world is a temporary world. This earthly world is a temporary one because at the end of it, everything dies. And sometimes things die cruelly and violently because in Pilate's world, people like Jesus are killed for being a nuisance and for getting in the way of power that's trying to conform things to itself. That's Pilate's world. Jesus' world is much different. As he says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom, my world, is greater than this earthly world. It transcends it. It includes it, but expands beyond it. It is higher than this world. It is a heavenly. It is a spiritual. It is a limitless. That's a limited world. This is a limitless world. And so the values that govern this world are different. In Jesus' kingdom, strength is measured not by how quickly you lash out and how strongly you can suppress. Strength is measured by spiritual gifts like self-control and resistance and patience because sometimes that's the wiser choice. In Jesus' world, power is not measured by how much you conform others to your will. It is about sometimes sacrificing self-interest and self-desire to serve the needs of those around you because that might be the wiser choice. It's the wiser choice because in Jesus' world, the long run is valued over the immediate moment. The long-term victory is always lifted up over instant gratification and short-term satisfaction. And so Jesus' world is an eternal one. It is a world of transformation, and at the end of it, it is a world of life and not death. In Jesus' world, the defeated and depressed, dejected, demoralized and downtrodden, and even the dead 
are transformed and lifted up and given new life. So it's a world of hope, not despair. And so here we are, you and I, we stand in the middle and we have a choice, right? The choice is ours. To whom will we give our attention? Pilate or Jesus? Oh, there's one more thing we ought to know and remember before we make our choice. God has already made God's choice that way. God has already chosen Christ to be the place, to be the world, to be the realm in which God will live and move and have being, where God can be found, where God will dwell and tabernacle. God could have chose Pilate's to be the place where God could be found, but no, God said, I am choosing Christ. That's, you see, what Advent and Christmas are about. God definitively and decisively choosing Christ and his world to break into ours. And it's about Christ choosing us to be part of that hope and to be part of that life and to be part of that world. And now I want to direct your attention to that picture in your bulletin, if you'd be so kind. You don't have to, but you're going to get more out of the message if you do. The yellow insert there, turn to the, the, the side that has the picture. And I'd like to lift up this painting because it illustrates our message really, really well today. This is a painting by the Italian artist Caravaggio. C-A-R-R-A-V-A-G-G-I-O. Just like it sounds, right? Caravaggio. You're welcome to search Google search, wiki search later. Uh, if you type in his name, this is the first picture that will pop up. <laughs> Caravaggio. This is one of his most famous paintings. It was painted or completed in the year 1600, so just over 400 years ago in Italy. It is called, it has a name. The name is The Calling of St. Matthew. The Calling of St. Matthew. Now, according to the gospel tradition, Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. Matthew was one of the twelve. Now, he's also referred to in the Bible as Levi, but same person, different name. So, Mark calls him Levi. Matthew, of course, calls him Matthew, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Either way, though, Matthew, before he was a disciple, was a tax collector. And Caravaggio's painting is meant to depict the moment at which Jesus, from the right side of the painting, breaks into the tax booth and points his finger at Matthew and says, Hey, you, come, follow me. But I want to unpack this a little bit because there's so much depth and richness to this painting. As I, and as I said, it illustrates our message very well. The first thing that I think we notice about this painting, maybe not the first thing, but one of the first things, is how dark it is. Agreed? And that's not just our office equipment or our staff who photocopied these. If you go and if you Google this and you bring this image up, even in color, even on your computer with whatever resolution you have, it will be a dark picture. Caravaggio was known and famous for contrasting light and darkness. But notice that it's, it has a dark tone to the picture. And if you look to the left, as you're looking at, there's about five figures who are gathered at the left-hand side of the painting. Those are the tax collectors. And one of the first things we notice is that the tax collectors are all sitting in darkness. Right? They're sitting in a dark room. And they don't seem to be bothered by the darkness. In other words, they don't even recognize that, that they're sitting in darkness until Christ comes in from the other side. And not only... When Christ comes in, not only does he come in, but notice that light comes in. 
Light comes in over his shoulder and illuminates the other end of the room. The, the, the tax collectors are sitting in darkness. They don't know they're in darkness until Christ comes in and his light shines upon them. What's more, these tax collectors on the left-hand side of the picture, they look surprised, some of them, don't they? They look up. A couple of them are looking up and looking at the direction of Jesus. Some of them have their eyes open as if to show us that they're surprised that Jesus came, as though Jesus wasn't invited, as though they weren't expecting him, not to suggest that they're doing anything nefarious or illegal, but just that they caught, were caught off guard, right? In other words, they didn't invite Jesus to come in, and yet Jesus came, interrupting their lives, interrupting their room, breaking into their darkness and bringing his light. And Jesus, of course, is the figure on the right. He's the, the figure on the right with the, the long finger and the arm stretched out, pointing to the other side of the room. That's the moment where he's looking at Matthew saying, come, follow me. Everybody with me so far? Heads nodding up and down? Here's the great mystery of Caravaggio's painting. To whom is he pointing? Right? Who's Matthew? Which one in that room is Matthew? Now, historians and scholars will debate. I mean, everybody debates when they look at this, as we're doing now, perhaps. But there's two kind of historical camps that people place themselves in. The first camp says that Matthew is the guy with the beard. Right, third from left. And if you draw that up in color, it's a nice, rich, orange beard. Kind of like Matthew Swarthout's beard. Red and orange. Right? So that's the first thought. Some people say it's that guy with the beard. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because he's also looking up. His eyes are wide open as though he's caught off guard. And his finger seems to be pointing back to himself, as if to say, who, me? R me? Really? Me, a tax collector? You, you, you want me to come be a part of your group? That seems to make sense with everything else we know about the story. But some people, another camp of people, they say that that's not who Matthew is, that Jesus is really pointing to the young man way at the other end. He's so shrouded in darkness on your picture that we can barely make out his details. He's at the end of the table. He's hunched over. His head is looking down. In other words, he's oblivious to everything going on around him. He doesn't look up to see Jesus come in because he's so focused on counting the money on his table. He's fixated on Pilate's lower world. Right? So here's my question to you. What do you think? Everybody has to par participate. No one gets to sit on the bench right now. Raise your hand if you think Matthew is the one in the red beard. Raise him up. Okay? Raise him up if you think it's the young man at the end of the table. Okay, here's my take on it. It doesn't matter. Right? No, I mean, and the fact that we're debating it is perfect. It's perfect. It further illustrates the point that any one of them could have been Matthew because Jesus came for all of them. He came for the red beard guy and the young man at the end of the table guy. Just as he came for everybody in the room. He could have been Matthew or he could have been Matthew. You could have been Matthew. Yes, one of them was actually called Matthew, but the light that came into the room is illuminating everybody. And that's the point. Christ comes into our lives to welcome not some of us or one of us in the room, but all of us. This whole month of December, we've been talking about choices. The choice is yours. And we've said over and over again that we don't always choose how life, uh, what comes at us in life. We don't always choose the circumstances of life. But we always get to choose how we respond, right? 
And three weeks ago, we talked about death. We talked about adversity. It was All Saints Day. And we said, how will we choose to respond to the adversity of death when death takes a loved one from us? Will we choose to persevere in our faith or will we choose to give up somehow? And then two weeks ago, we talked about serving. We said, will we choose to follow Christ's example and serve others or will we choose to have others serve us? And last week we spoke of gratitude. We said, will we choose to see everything that we have as a gift to be treasured and not taken for granted because it can leave us at any time? Our health, our loved ones, physical things. Or will we choose to eh, be so self-absorbed that we end up not appreciating what we have as a gift and assume that it's ours forever? Today, As we close the month of of November and end this sermon series, we have the perfect way to end it. With Caravaggio's painting, we have the culmination of our discussion on choices and a perfect summation of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And here it is. God chooses Christ to come into our lives to bring light to our darkness and guidance for a new way of living. And Christ chooses us, not one of us at the table, not some of us in the room, but all of us to be part of that. And here's the even better part. Even if you and I mess up, and even if we make all the wrong choices, quote-unquote wrong choices, even if in our grief we get so stuck that we can't seem to choose to power through and persevere in our faith, even if we, even in spite of our best intentions, assume that others are there to serve our wants and wishes, or even in a more noble sense, if we haven't figured out how best to use our spiritual gifts in the service of others, because that whole thing is confusing, and even if we don't appreciate what we have as a gift and we do take things for granted, even if we make all these wrong choices, guess what? Christ still comes. He still comes. He still breaks into our lives whether we invite him or not. He still makes his light to shine in our darkness whether we recognize it or not. And he still stretches out a finger to all of us And says, you, come, follow me. There's room for you in my kingdom. If we are serious, if you and I are serious about keeping Christ in Christmas, we should worry about this, this message, and this truth a lot more than worrying about if someone says happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas in a Facebook post or a Christmas card. Thanks be to God.